Toss aside the touchy-feely notions of love in business and recognize the real power it holds. Welcome to the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast with host Steve Farber, drawing on his work with a wide variety of companies from the Fortune 100 to smaller family-owned businesses. Farber shares inspiring interviews with business leaders and proven strategies for how you can create experiences that your customers will love by developing a culture that your employees, teammates, and colleagues love working in. Discover why and how love at the end of the day is just a damn good business for you too. Here's your host, Steve Farber. Hi, and welcome to the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast. I'm your host, Steve Farber. Thanks for tuning in. And I invite you to, uh, to visit our sponsor, the Extreme Leadership Institute, which is no coincidence because I'm also the CEO and the founder of that company. Uh, come visit us at extremeleadership.com. Check out what we do. In short, we help companies to operationalize love, energy, audacity, and proof in the way they do business to remarkable effect, I have to say. Today, my guest is the wonderful Marty Glenn. I'm going to read you a little bit from Marty's bio, and then we're going we're gonna to dive into our conversation. I'm very excited to have her here with me today. She spoke at our, our last uh, Extreme Leadership Experience in, in February of 2020. 20. That's this year as we're recording this. It seems like decades ago. We got that one in under the wire before COVID shut everything down. And uh, we were absolutely thrilled to have Marty uh, speak to the group and also participate in the, in the entire three-day conference. Marty Glenn is dedicated to helping people transform their lives. As co-founder and chief experience officer of Rizio Institute, she conducts professional trainings and intensive retreats internationally that make it possible for leaders to move beyond coping into thriving, which is a big challenge nowadays. Marty is particularly keen on crafting experiences and practices that develop the brain and nervous system and even change the trajectory of our DNA. Integrating the latest research in epigenetics, polyvagal theory, neuroscience, psychology, leadership, and mindfulness, she and her team offer experiences and practices to help leaders live the lives they long for. She has discovered and delights in teaching the secret sauce that underlines all of this research. Drum roll, please. Wait for it. And that is love. Funnily enough, an award-winning, an award-winning, award-winning is not easy to say by the way, an award-winning pioneering professor and psychotherapist. Man, your use of alliteration in this thing is fantastic. Uh, Marty has served as founder and CEO of a number of successful companies and nonprofit organizations over the past four decades. She is founding president of Santa Barbara Graduate Institute, known for its graduate degrees in perinatal psychology, somatic psychology, and clinical psychology. She has served on the boards of a number of national organizations and has chaired numerous international professional conferences. She co-produced the broadcast quality documentary, Trauma, Brain, and Relationship. I think I've got two out of three of those covered. Uh, featuring Daniel Siegel and Bruce Perry and has appeared in a number of documentary films. Marty Glenn, PhD, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Steve. I don't know who wrote that, but it's a lot of words. A lot of words. <laughs> it's a lot of words. We could just do that. away with that. I'll tell you this. I didn't write it. No, you sure didn't. <laughs> but I hope you did it justice by reading it. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. It's so wonderful to be here. So tell us, uh, first of all, I want to hear a little bit about, about your, your story. So, you know, it's not as, you know, it's not the old, you know, uh, who was it? Uh, uh, Barbara Wallace, you know, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? Not, not that kind of story, necessarily. Yeah. But, but tell us, let's, let's start with uh, the, you know, the factual side of the story. That we can yes. Well, I'll tell you a thread that goes through that helped me get where I am today. 
Um, I, as I think about it and have tried to put things together, I was a very curious kid. I always ask questions. I know I drove my mother crazy because I would say, well, who lives in that house? Or why is this happening? Why are those people driving and those people are walking? And I would say, mama, what's their name? Who is that? She would say, somebody you don't know. <laughs> so she had no idea how to answer all my questions. And fast forward, I, it was a very, very crazy, very abusive family. Um, I'm not sure how we all survived. There were six of us. And as I got out and got on my own and went to college and began looking at things, I kept wondering, why is it that I made it? Why am I, and by made it, I mean, I wasn't addicted to drugs. I didn't have severe mental illness. I didn't mean I didn't have trauma to overcome, but I was doing okay. And half of my siblings were severely um, in trouble. And so that kind of set me on a path to look at what is going on here? What is that resiliency factor or what helps us get where we need to go? And in my doctoral research, I was working with professors from three different business colleges, three different universities, and we were looking at, we honed the question in on what creates job satisfaction? What helps us feel satisfied with the place that we work? And I thought, hey, I've got a good personality. I'll bet you personality type determines how good we feel about our work. Well, I was dead wrong. Personality type has very, very little to do with how we feel about where we work. Hmm. And yeah, so that was, you know, a little bit of a setback, which is so, fine. So let, me, let me just, uh, yeah. I'm curious, because you, your, your degree, your initial degree was in that, what, what, under what umbrella was that? You were getting a PhD. It's in education and psychology. Education, psychology, and counseling, that, right? That was your desire to uh, to learn about that came from your experience in growing up, in right? That. Right. So, so what was it that that brought you from that to focusing on on the the job experience, the work experience as part of your as part of your research? <laughs> I had some of my professors said, you really need to go into business. You need to work with people in business. I mean, okay, you know, I'll do that. And so he contacted professors for which is unusual, but um, professors from I was at the University of Florida and uh, professors from Florida State and Florida Atlantic University and then the University of Florida. And they were all saying they're the ones that crafted this with me to say, okay, you need to look at this. And I went, okay. And the truth is, I had two little kids. I had no way to earn a living. And I just wanted to get the hell out of Dodge. I didn't care how we did it. But I was curious. Very curious. So, so you're, so, so I'm getting choked up. So your, um, your foray into business uh, is one that, uh, the, the, the reason behind it, is the reason that a lot of people focus on business, I know this is going to sound obvious, it's because it was a way to actually monetize this field right. that we're interested in, right? <laughs> That's right. That's exactly oh, right. This in, 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 in what makes us tick. Now, if I can figure out a way to actually make a living by helping people to apply that. Right. So that brought right. you business. Okay. So back to your point about personality really has nothing to do with the level of job satisfaction. Say a little bit more about that. Well, the type of personality does determine, for example, am I an extrovert or an introvert? That does have to do with how I'm going to relate to people, what my needs are. It really, if we know that, it helps us have compassion for each other. Um, if I know that you and I are both extroverts, which I would guess is pretty true, then we're going to both want to talk most of the time, right? Right. And my husband, Ken, is very much an introvert. And I can imagine he doesn't have anything to say. He doesn't have any opinions. He just sits in the meeting and says nothing. But that's not true. And so it helps me have compassion and slow down a little bit if I can realize, oh, we're bringing something different to the table. My needs are different than his. And his thoughts 
and his ideas are gold if I'll just shut up and listen. <laughs> yeah, and now is this something that you tell yourself or is this something that he, re- that he reminds you of? Oh, no, he, he's so sweet. He does not remind me. I have to tell myself, right? <laughs> I have to monitor myself because I want to know what he has to say. And the same is true in meetings. Probably a third to a half of the people sitting around the table in our meetings are what we would call an introvert or an internal, I, write, I like to call it an internal processor. Mm. I, I process things inside my head. Or like the Irishman said, how do I know what I have to say about it until I, how do I know what I think about it until I've heard what I have to say about it? So I have to say out loud what I'm thinking and probably drive some people crazy, but it's okay because we're all different and we, we are aware that we have these differences and we process in different ways. And so we learn to have compassion for each other and share our gifts. So tell me about, about the, um, the physiological side of your, um, of your research, your findings, the work that you do. And by that, I mean, you know, how, how the brain, what you found about how the brain plays into leadership and, and our job satisfaction and our relationships and all that. I mean, obviously the the brain plays a role in all of that because without it, we wouldn't have any experience, but what specific way or ways have you found the the connection there? Let me back up a little bit. Um, I was preparing to make a big keynote speech at a conference on this very subject. And I thought, you know, I better check out the science here, see what's coming up before I actually take the microphone. And I really delved into some of the sciences in epigenetics, polyvagal theory, which is the neuro neuro system, um, neuroscience, and um, attachment, trauma, psychology, all of those. And these major systems were all saying exactly the same thing. And none of them seemed to know that they were saying the same thing that the others were saying. And they were saying that we need three things in order to thrive in our lives, in our businesses, in our team uh, relationships. And um, what what they've discovered is that, for example, the, the gut and the heart tell the brain what to do. We think it's the brain, but it's not. If I'm not feeling safe and seen and okay to show up when I come to my team meeting, I'm going to keep my mouth shut or I'm going to say what I think you want to hear. But if I feel welcome and seen and it's okay for me to make mistakes, I feel safe, then my gut is going to be relaxed. My heart will be relaxed and my heart will tell my brain that it's okay to move forward and have these new ideas and push into something that we haven't thought of before. So when you say your heart, are you talking about, about a physiological response in the actual heart organ? Or are you talking about the, uh, the, the, the feeling level that we associate with that part of the body? Well, let me, again, let me back up a little bit and tell you how the nervous system forms just quickly. There's a nerve, um, I call it the nerve you never heard of is running your life. It's the vagus nerve and it's the longest nerve in the body. And it goes all the way from the head, the inner ear, all the way down to the gut. And what happens is when we're born, we hear the human voice and the little nerve endings inside our ears start to thicken, connect with each other. And then we see the facial expressions and we begin to have the eye contact, so the nerve endings around our eyes begin to form and thicken and so that we can read, appropriately read, facial expressions. That get our voice, the tone of voice that we hear, the facial expression tells us a lot. That vagus nerve then moves down on either side of the neck and around the heart. And if we're in a, a loving connected environment, 
that's going to thicken and develop around the heart. The, the nervous system is going to settle. The heart's going to settle. That goes down around the belly. And guess what? If that part of the nervous system is well developed, we can digest our food. Now, if for some reason we didn't have caregivers who were nurturing and stable and calm and all of that very present for us, and by the way, if your mom didn't have it, she can't give it to you, so we're not blaming mom, thank goodness, because I am one. <laughs> I had no idea what to do with my kids. I do now, but, um, but if we didn't, the good news is science is telling us we can get it now. So when we go into a conversation, Steve, and, and I have to say, I saw this with you at the Extreme Leadership Experience. I hadn't met you before. We'd had some conversations. But you and your whole team, Veronica, Jenna, the whole team greeted us. First of all, you oriented us. You greeted us with eye contact like I was the only person in the world and like you had all day, not like you had a list of 50 things to do, which I knew you did. But for that second, you were right there with me, and I knew it. So my whole nervous system felt safe, and I settled, and I joined the team and jumped right in and did whatever it was. In fact, I, had, I felt so safe, I did some things on stage there I have never done before, ever. I told my real story. I broke into song with people I've never seen before. <laughs> and we all just had a great time. But you laid the foundation for all of us in creating safety. And that's number one in no matter what we do that helps the nervous system to settle and helps the brain to know, okay, we can go now. So it is long answer to your question. It's a physiological response to the outside stimuli. It's the, what I'm seeing and feeling. And you can say to me, um, Marty, you're really welcome here. I'm so glad you're here. Now here's your project and let's get on with it. Do I feel welcome and safe? I don't think so. So to, to summarize that a bit, the, the feeling, the experience that we have when we're young, the degree to which we're supported and encouraged and all that, actually physically grows the vagus nerve. Yes, and the brain. And, and, and the, so that it's that nerve that's connecting the brain all the way down that's right. to the gut. That's right. So we're actually having a physical uh, influence. On that's right. And then if you fast forward to now, now we're adults, we're, you, we're fully formed nervous system, that nerve is still responding, right? That's correct. Uh, saying that we can still we can still develop that yes. Cool yes. curve. Yes. Okay, so then what I'm hearing, that's what I thought you said. So so this whole idea about that we should all we all intellectually know anyhow that we should you know uh, uh, create an environment where people feel safe for the uh, the environment of trust, an environment of love. Right. An environment of, of support that if we focus on that first, we we're likely to get a better quality of work because of the effect that actually has on the entire physiology in a person. That's so right. let me tell people be present. Right. Don't check your don't check your text and your voicemail when somebody's in your office talking to them or you're on a Zoom call with them as we tend to do nowadays that's right. you know, because it's just not nice. Well, that's true. It's not nice, but it's also having a physiological effect on people. And then you, you wonder about, you know, why don't people speak up and why don't we get a better quality of work? Right. It could be because right. you're, you're going too quickly to our, our conditioning as business people, which is to say that business is a purely rational endeavor so when I want people to do things, I, I need to just tell them what to do so they're clear on it. Right. And then we get it done. And we skip that whole foundational step if we're not That's careful. That's right. That's right. And all of this research, one of the exciting things is they're saying we need three things in order to do this. The first one we've talked about is safety. 
And we're not talking about not falling down somewhere. We're talking about what you just said, that safety of who I am and how I show up is okay. It's okay to make mistakes here. It's okay to take a risk. It's okay to be vulnerable because I know you've got my back and that's okay. And when I feel safe, then I can begin to have experiences of who I really am. Now, I, we all have these weird beliefs about ourselves of I'm not enough, I'm too much, I'm, you know, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, I'm whatever. We all have those. And if you can help me have an experience because of what I'm doing and how we're interacting, that I am good and I am worthy and I produce something for you and I bring you this report, you could say, good report, glad you did the project, now here's the next one. No. But if you sit down with me and you say, Marty, you know, I, I, I can see how much time you put on this. And, you know, you ordered it in a different way and you added this thing to it. And that really helped our team understand where we need to go with this. So basically, you describe what you liked about it. And then I have a different experience inside my body of myself. And that's the second one. I have experiences of me and being accepted and loved and all that. And the third thing that's really important for us as human beings is you are the witness. I have to have it witnessed. You have kids. I have kids. We know kids just, they, they, they want you to, they want you to see them. And the people we work with are no different. I want you to see me from every angle. I want you to notice what I've done. And those three things, when we do those, produces the deepest love, the best commitment, greater health than any of us can imagine. So that last one about wanting to be seen. Yes. If you go back to the kind of the stereotypical introvert. Yes. And I've known people like this who, who at least on the surface, claim they don't want to be seen. They don't want to be. They don't, in other words, what they're saying is, don't shine the spotlight on me. That's don't, right. Don't have me stand up and say, Marty did such a great job. Everybody give her a round of applause. For, for me and for you, that's like the greatest thing. Whoa. Other people. <laughs> that's right. For other people, that's, that's torture. So we think when we ask them to stand up, that we're, we're, we're giving them the opportunity to be seen. Right. But there are many ways to be seen, right? Thank you. Yes. And being seen, um, I call it look for the good and name it. So I see what you're doing well. I see what you're doing that's working. And I don't label it and say, good job. Thanks for that. I notice and I describe what I'm seeing that's good. And that's seeing me. So can you that's, give me an example? Well, um, if I describe that you've just done something and I actually go, I noticed that you did this and, you know, we usually do that part of it first. And you took a risk and you said to hell with that and you did the next one and you came up with something new and it worked. You're saving us a ton of time here. See, I'm describing what they're doing and why it worked. As opposed to saying, hey, that th that good job on that thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Forget it. We all want to be seen. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, we've been cleaning in the yard, you know, pulling weeds and stuff. And I noticed that for years, I will pull a stack of weeds out of a bed in the garden and leave them for Ken, my husband, to come and pick up. And I'm going, this is ridiculous. Why am I leaving this stack of weeds for him to go and haul off? I wanted him to see the work that I had done. I was just howling with laughter at myself and realizing, you know, if somebody does something, we want you to notice that I did it. Yeah. So does that mean that, that if we don't feel like we're being seen, that that it's okay to, to call attention to it ourselves? Well, we... <laughs> I did the dishes. I just, right? You know, I took the garbage out. Me, myself, without you even asking me. I How know. 
Right. Well, there are times, whether you're in a relationship at home or with a team or even with your kids, to say, you know, I'm noticing this is something that I would appreciate. I'd like to, and, and usually we don't even have to say that. We just demonstrated ourselves and then they catch on. I lead by example, right? Right. So tell me a little bit about the, I remember you, you talked a little bit about the, the mechanics of fight or flight and, and that there's, there's, I'm, I'm trying to remember the context. I'm sure I don't need to remind you of that, but there was that other element that was very, that tends to be very surprising to people. Yes. So yes. You talking about. I do. I do. Thank you for bringing it up. It's part of the polyvagal theory. Uh, Stephen Porges, a uh, research professor at the University of North Carolina now, um, discovered that as human beings, we have three branches to our nervous system. We always thought we had two, fight, flight, and freeze. But he goes, no, 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 no. As human beings, our best go-to place is human connection. And before I go into fight or flight or freeze, fight, flight, or freeze, I need to connect with a human being. I need to have an experience that I'm safe, that who I am is okay, and that you're noticing me. And when I do that, my whole nervous system relaxes, and I can stay in what the neuroscientists call my window. They call it a window of tolerance. We call it, right here, we call it a window of presence, I can stay present with you and we can interact without me either shutting down or being protective. And so if somebody's going off the rails, it's really helpful to say to myself, if they're getting anxious or angry or they're pushing back or they're mad at something I did, it's good for me to just take a breath and I tell myself, I don't say it out loud, but I tell myself, oh, they're not feeling safe right now. And so I try to use the social engagement system, which is what the scientists call it, that people to people part. And the best way to do that when somebody is at the top of their window is I slow down, I lower my tone of voice, and I just hang out for a minute. Or I might say, hmm, yeah, I think we ought to look at that more closely. I'm not defending. I'm not giving my part of it. I'm not telling them how wrong they are. Because the truth is, once we go out of our window, and we, if this is your brain and you flip your lid, once I flip my lid, it takes 28 minutes to come back online where we can have a reasonable conversation. When you say flip, flip my lid, it means I've gone into fight or fight. Yes. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and there are ways, and we do have people that have a tendency more to just shut down and leave. And they go, okay, well, I, okay, I can do that. No problem. All right. Yeah. No, that's okay. No, what's wrong? Nothing. I'm okay. They shut down. And you can't reach them because they've gone below their window and there's nobody home. Yeah. So we know... It's kind of conventional wisdom again that you know fight fight or flight is is uh, what happens when we're faced with something that we interpret to be as a potentially life threatening situation, right? That's, exactly. Um, evo evolutionarily, where it exactly. It's a word. So uh, you know, there's a bear. I either I either I'm either going to wrestle the bear, or I'm going to try to get the hell out of there, or I'm going to freeze. I just my whole body, right. there's nothing I can do. So that happens in, in any kind, any kind of, of threatening encounter, even, or something that we perceive as a threat, even though it's not, you know, literally life threatening. So that's why people get angry. That's why people yell. That's why people that's right. shut up. That's why people tune out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because we believe this is, tell me if I'm, if I'm thinking about this along the right lines, because we believe that it's fight or flight or freeze, we have a tendency to respond to somebody else's fight impulse in the same way, right? That's right. You fight, I'll fight. 
You fight, I'll freeze. You, you freeze, and I'll try to you know, snap you out of it. You know, it's, it's, it's a fight or right. fight response. But now that we, we, we know that it's not simply fight, flight, or freeze, there's also connection. Right. Right. Is that's that, right. Is that, is that the right that's word? That's exactly right. That's so, right. And this, and that's our. If I'm understanding this correctly, that's our preferred state. That's correct. So if I can provide a feeling of connection and trust and support in that very moment where I might impulsively go to a fight or flight sort right. of thing, right. uh, I can. I can diffuse the whole situation. Now, there, there are a few things here that strike me as being particularly relevant given the time in which we're having this conversation. So in, in, a, in a time of COVID, uh, when people are more, uh, in, more separated, mm -hmm. there is literally less physical connection. And our response in a lot of ways, you know, many people it is a fight or flight or freeze response to this whole pandemic. You know, so what do I do? I don't know what to do. So I won't do anything. Uh, I'm panicking. I'm, uh, you know, there's, there's, there are lots of people having similar responses. And what strikes me is that the opportunity inherent in that is that we we're all experiencing similar challenge which gives us the opportunity to connect more. That's right. Because we can relate to it. Is that? Is That's correct. Well, we need to. We need to find ways to relate. Thank goodness for Zoom. I mean, if we didn't have Zoom and we, were all, we only had the sound of a voice on the phone, very different. But when we're on Zoom, I can use a lot of my nonverbal cues to help us um, come back. Um, first of all, I can know inside my own head that you may have three little kids at home running around and you're not sure when one of them is going to break in and be having a fight. Or, you know, you've got a lot of stress going on. We don't know when this is going to end. All the kinds of business stresses that are happening. And... I can do all of the nonverbal cues. I can try to have eye contact with you, which is a little difficult if you've got eight people on the screen, but still we're there. And I tell people, if you want to move faster, slow down. The way we get more done is by slowing down. And that pacing and timing gives you an unconscious clue that you're okay that I'm okay, that we're in this situation together and I'm understanding. Because if I'm going slow, I'm right? running. That's right. Good point. I never thought of that. If I'm going slow, I'm not running. I'm not running toward you and I'm not running away from you. Right? So, the, so going slow is good. And I mentioned a minute ago, I can also from time to time just lower the tone of my voice because when I get excited, my voice goes up like this and I can talk really fast and I just get so excited that I'm going to do this thing. And everybody else is going, oh, what is she talking about? Right? So slowing down, lowering the tone of voice. And as you said a minute ago, being very present. It's very easy if we've got a whole bunch of people on a Zoom call, we're having a meeting for me to do my email and nobody will ever know. Maybe. But the truth is, I will know because I'm not feeling the connection and I need that connection. And going back to what you said about how we are um, physiologically tuned from birth to uh, recognize other people's facial expressions. Right. So this is what I've been noticing in, in all the zoom meetings and webinars and so forth that I've been doing is in many ways, these calls can feel more intimate. Right. If I'm, if I'm sitting in, let's say I'm sitting in an audience and, and a, there's a bunch of us in that room listening to a speaker. I'm sitting in an audience, I'm part of that group and we're all looking at a speaker who's up there on stage at a distance. Right. Right. In a Zoom call, 
my brain tells me that I'm sitting there one-on-one -on -one with that same speaker, right? We're, right. we're quite literally face-to-face. -face. And if I, have, if I have it on gallery view, right. I'm looking into everybody's face. That's right. And don't, That's right. Because I, I do. Do you do that? I do. Yes, that. I, I do. Rolling yeah. through the screens. Let's say there's 100 people on the call. <laughs> And, and, you know, people waving to each other and, you know, know. and it's like, wow, this is, <laughs> yeah. this is pretty cool. So what, what you're telling us is that that's, that's actually a, we're creating a physiological response, even right. though we're not literally, you know, sitting in the same room and breathing the same oxygen. Right. Well, the components of that are facial expression, tone of voice, gestures, posture, timing, and intensity. All of that we can do on Zoom, right? Yes, and we can also do that from, from the vantage point of not being the speaker, of being the participant. So, for example, right. uh, you know, a lot of people, we've, we've seen, you know, lots of, uh, you know, memes and viral videos of people, let's just say, forgetting that they're on camera. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I mean, I like to say that, I, you know, I really enjoy doing these meetings because, you know, I, I have a great session with people and it's very valuable and, and, and I can do the whole thing in my underwear. It's fantastic. Right, as right. Well, I remember that that's the case. That's right. Uh, that's so right. What, I'm, what I'm saying is that what I love playing around with is when I'm part of a group, I make myself hyper aware of my presence on the screen as part of the group. That's right. In other words, what what does my face look like? Am I am I doing right. Netflix face? You know, with the with a you know kind of uh, sloopy eyes, droop, droop, right, right, sloopy eye, yeah. droopy eye, right. slack jaw. You know, because I'm just not aware. But I've had people tell me after a meeting. I mean, literally, I've had people write to me, email me as, as a fellow participant after a meeting and saying. I just wanted you to know that it was so, it was so great to see your smiling face on there. Oh, cute. So we actually have an opportunity to influence each other's state of mind, the state of being That's simply right. by how we're showing up with our face. That's right. That's right. Exactly. And that's what we learned, we, what we read. I did not think it was possible. People were, were saying, oh, let's take our programs on Zoom. And I'm going, are you kidding me? No, it's not going to work. And then we went, okay. I was stunned. We're doing all of our programs now on Zoom while we have to. And it's amazing the depth to which people are willing to go because they feel safe. They're having an experience together because, as you say, we can see each other. And I'm conscious of my presence and where I'm looking, whereas if we were sitting around a, a table, I might not. I might be going, oh, God, when is Steve going to stop talking, right? You know, um, but here I, I've got to stay on alert. I'm there. So, and the same is true in breakout sessions too. On Zoom. Yes, we do a lot of breakouts. Yeah, because you can't escape from that. I'll no, you pop into a room with two other people, <laughs> and you can't start right. your email because then people think you're an asshole. So you got to. That's right. That's you right. have to be. You have to be present even That's more right. so if you're sitting there, chair to chair. So let me let me ask you this: uh, given given this conversation about connection virtually, I mean, it's really important because every business is is dealing with that and you know mm -hmm. learning about it and you know the pros and cons and we have zoom burnout and you know, uh, lots of, you know there's a downside to everything right we call it zoom fatigue yeah zoom fatigue but in, in this in in these days um we the the desire for connection it's not that the desire for connection is any greater than it's ever been it's just that we're more aware of it right? that's right and That's right. You can actually use virtual, uh, virtual platforms like Zoom. We could use it without hesitation, because it's actually can, it's it's creating the right, right emotional and physical response. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me ask you this question, and and this is a peek behind the curtain for our listeners. So you know we do we do certifications, the Extreme Leadership Workshop, mm -hmm. and we we've, we've done those you know, here in San Diego, live, you know, four day sessions, right. 20 people at a time, uh, very in depth, 
And, you know, we have one scheduled for the end of September, beginning of October. And of course, then this whole scenario came up. Right. So now we're faced with several questions, like everybody else on the planet. Do we just postpone that certification? Or do we do it virtually? So internally, we're, having, we're still having this conversation and I'm reaching out to people that have already registered for it to get their, you know, their take on it. What, what would they prefer to do since they already you know, committed to it? Mm-hmm. Um, and so far, it seems to be about half and half. And my, my predilection is to say we should do it virtually because, because of exactly what we're talking about here. And it can be, it, we're not compromising the intimacy by doing it. In fact, we might even be enhancing it in some ways. Mm-hmm. And then we'll do a live, you know, a live day when we can, where we can all get okay. together. Right. right. Eat together. Right. Or play some music, right. All that good stuff. So yeah. what, you, so based on the conversation that we're having and, and the whole physiological and, uh, you know, nervous system elements of this, what do you think? Well, I, we're doing it. And um, what I've discovered is that um, the mind can only absorb so much as the seat can stand. That's what my mother used to say. So we have to take breaks. So if we have an all day meeting, um, we take breaks, you know, just like we would if we were in person. Sure. And that really helps. And when we come back, um, we come together. And, and by the way, when we begin, we have a moment where we do something like read a poem. I wish we could sing together, but we can't because yeah. <laughs> that would be wonderful. You could pick up your guitar and everybody could go for it, but that doesn't really work. But having a moment where we all pause and we come together and I see all the eyes on the screen and I bring myself present ground myself as it were is very, very helpful and we orient, which of course you always do. You're very good at that. And the major thing here is how do we give people experiences? Because it's not the information that we need. It's not the brain stuff. You do not call it the extreme leadership conference. You call it the extreme leadership experience because it's the experience that changes our brain, grows our nervous system, and actually changes the trajectory of our DNA. That's what's creating health in our nervous systems and in our relationships. So having that capacity to be present and give them an experience, which you just named having breakout rooms, you'll have them practice things, you have them do all of this, if they can have the experience in their bodies, not just taking in information, which is not what you do, then you've got a winner. And it's very, very worthwhile. Yeah. I think it's necessary now because we need it now more than ever. So if we expand that out beyond and use kind of my scenario as an example, for leaders out there today who are running virtual teams. Right. They've been doing so for several months now, many of them. Um, And people are getting that Zoom fatigue. Right. Maybe it's because we've been approaching Zoom calls as if they're telephone calls with a visual element to it. Whereas really what what I'm hearing you say is, let's, let's treat these meetings, whatever the meeting is, whether it's a weekly, you know, catch up or a huddle or whatever, let's treat them as, as an experience, as the experience that they, that they are and right. get creative about how as a, as a leader of a team, I can you know, bring people in so they're not just sitting there, you know, listening to a bunch of talking heads, but mm-hmm. they're engaging mm-hmm. in the news. Right. The other thing that we do, which I'm sure you do as well, is that everybody mutes and then we go around and every person responds. We do a check in, but it's not like, oh, today I had cereal for breakfast. It's um, a very poignant question that takes us to some deep, deep sharing, which is meaningful. 
And so I have an experience of you sharing something that's meaningful in your life. And I connect with that on an emotional level. And then I feel connected to you and the next person and the next person. So it's not you coming in and delivering information to us and saying, okay, how's the project going, blah, blah, blah. But we're talking about how we feel about things, what we think about things. And it doesn't take long, a couple of minutes per person to go around and have everybody, we call it, put their voice in the circle. Mm. So that when you put your voice in the circle, it's all the things that you know. Right. I feel a part of things. I feel seen. I experience you being here with me. I'm not just showing up and taking down information. Right. Very different. Yeah, that's great. Fantastic. So there's one other, one other element about um, our unusual times that strikes me. This fight, flight, freeze connection. If we're looking at the, you know, the whole um, conversation now and the protests and the upheaval about uh, violence, you know, police violence. And we look at all these examples that, cr that, you know, that spark the protests on the Black Lives Let uh, Matter movement, et cetera. So many of those circumstances were things that escalated pure fight or flight and got out of hand very quickly. That's right. As opposed to taking an approach of, you know, what's become a pretty you know, popular word now, de-escalation. This is this, essentially what you're talking about, right? I mean, right. That, that is, that's a, uh, a, a more extreme example because that can literally feel like, and sometimes, you know, often, sometimes, sometimes often, often is life or death. Right. Um, so if you were, if you were advising uh, a police force, given your knowledge of how the brain and nervous system works, what kind of advice would you give? Well, first of all, I would not go in and give them advice. <laughs> I would, the first thing I would do is I'd want to hear their stories. I'd want to hear about their fears. I'd want to hear about their experiences and what that was like for them. And for any of us, when I get chill bumps, imagining that happening. Um, but Anytime my story is heard, then my nervous system settles and I can feel a part of things and I can hear what you have to say. But if I go in and I give advice to anybody, it could be a group of police, it could be anybody, nobody's listening. La, 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 they don't care. Until I've made a connection, it, it, I, it's, it's crazy. It, it's not going to happen. But if I feel like you're here with me, you understand my story or you understand where I'm coming from or that it's just okay that I'm different or whatever that is. And I can take a breath, my nervous system relaxes, and then I can open to hear what you have to say. So, so the... Um, uh national dialogue, international dialogue that yes. happen. Yes. All this is really what you're describing, right? It's that's right. Maybe instead of this this dynamic that we've created for ourselves of about so many things, you know, in mm -hmm. politics and religion and mm -hmm. everything else mm -hmm. that's so polarized is because I'm telling you and you're telling me. Right. And not just stopping and listening to the other perspective because I'll speak for myself. I'm a pretty chill guy, right? Yeah, me too. I'm telling you, there are certain things and I'm always very right? careful to, to, to avoid overt political commentary in my work for reasons that we could talk about some other. Sure. Time. But I, I sometimes find myself getting overshadowed, overwhelmed, when I'm hearing a strong point of view that's very different from my own. Right. I don't like that in myself, but I do find it and it makes it really hard for me 
just to sit back and listen and try right. to understand, which is right. exactly what I need to do. That's right. Well, oftentimes the hardest thing to do is exactly what we need. So That's it's right. practice, right? It does. And it also, um, it's also helpful if I can say, okay, what does that remind me of? Or what is there in that that feels unsafe to me? It's not just I'm adamant, I don't like those people and they're nasty and blah, blah, blah. You know, not all of that. But just looking inside myself and then I try to look and see where have I done the same kind of thing? Maybe not in the same level or the same, but the only difference in us is that, you know, your flag looks different than mine. But if I can find some commonality and I can find some connection within myself to have some compassion um, for what is going on, and then I can listen better, doesn't mean I have to agree or that I would ever agree but we're not going to ever come together until I can have some understanding and some compassion. And that's true on any, any level of our being. Um, Glodine champion has contacted me and we're going to have some of these conversations with people inviting people in to say, what's your experience? So and Glodine, for, for people who are listening, who are, who yes, don't. thank you. So Glodine is one of our, uh, one of our certified facilitators at the Extreme Leadership Institute, uh, really powerful woman. She spoke at the at the event. African American woman, uh, very um, well spoken and outspoken, and is is really doing her best to respond to these to these That's times right. from a place of love and That's creating right. the right kind of conversations across all the various lines that That's we. Right. And walls right. and between ourselves. So what I'm what I'm hearing you say a big part of this is is changing changing our objective from convincing to understanding. Beautifully said. So yes. instead of you know we we sit down and we have a conversation we have a debate, right? right. <laughs> uh, it's 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 the wrong it's it's the wrong objective. If my goal is that by the time we're done talking together, I'm going to understand you and you're going to understand me. And maybe yes. we won't come to any so-called conclusion. But what we will have done, if I'm hearing right. this right, is contributed to the growth of each other's vagus nerve. That's right. That's exactly right. And what you just said is so, so important. I don't care if it's a couple having an argument, if it's a team at work that can't get along. The most important question for us to ask is, what is my goal here? What's the most important thing here? Is the most important thing for me to be right? Is it most important for me to win? Is it most important for me to show how big I am and strong? Or is it important that our relationships survive and grow? And I often find almost all the time that it's the relationship that's the most important thing here. And when I can keep that in mind, then that can dictate my responses. Yeah. So it's focusing, focusing the attention on the relationship, the culture, and, you know, in, in your, as we be, uh, bring this in for a landing, in your bio that I read at the outset, you, you said, or some whoever wrote this said, <laughs> the whole time, she has discovered and delights in teaching the secret sauce that underlies all of this research, love. So as we bring this in for a landing, the question is, what's love got to do with all of this? Love has everything to do with all of it because when I'm present and I show up, I'm listening, I'm just here with you. I know what's the most important thing here. I care about you. I care about our organization. I care about our family and I'm present. That's love. That is love. And when I can be in that place in me, and you can be in that place in you, there's only one of us in that moment. And
and we can move forward in whatever way we need to because of the love. That is beautifully said. Uh, so before, before we say our farewells, um, how should people get in touch with you? What's the best way to learn more about what you do and to learn about Rizio and to connect with you, et cetera? Thank you. Rizio.com. It's like we're rising together. R-Y-Z-I-O. When we first figured it out, I couldn't even spell it. And I had to go R-Y-Z-I-O, R-Y-Z-I-O. Anyway, well, Rizio.com. I always say. What's that? If you can't spell it, sing it. That's right. And it doesn't matter. Just sing it anyway. By the way, singing grows the vagus nerve. So that's why we sing, right? Yeah, that's great. So, so later on today, uh, I'm going to have a session where my intent will be to grow my vagus nerve. All right. Get, get your guitar out. Exactly. I love it. Okay, Marty, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What a treat. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you for listening to another episode of Love is Just Damn Good Business with Steve Farber. Join us again next time because when customer and employee satisfaction just isn't enough anymore, we are here to back you up with specific ideas to operationalize love to make an enormous difference in your business, personal life, and the world around you. Visit our website at stevefarber.com to leave a review. And don't forget to share the love with your colleagues and friends because after all, it's just damn good business.